Halcyon, the Book of Pyman, is a fantasy horror podcast inspired by historical events and characters. This is a work of fiction and was created, developed, and produced by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and beliefs. Professor Pyman lives in a dangerous world. His story contains themes of violence, gore, and attempted sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. He had to go. Yes. Quicker than I had hoped, but he tried to touch my girls. And you know I can't allow that. Ha! <laughs> Barely even worth the effort. These humans are weak tea indeed. Gideon, you know what to do. Do make sure to remember to weigh him down properly. We don't need any questions. Oh, and sell us pocket watch. You need a new suit. Chapter 2 of Lost Things Sidney had instructed Calliope to wait for him by the performer's entrance after the final act, which she did, marveling at the fantastical costumes and gawking at the menagerie of animals. The circus was turning out to be even more than Calliope could have ever hoped for. The show, its performers, and the stories they all must have. Calliope couldn't wait to explore. And although she found him a bit strange, what luck to have the ringmaster as her guide. As she felt herself whirling around in the hurricane of the show, listening to the music still playing as the patrons left, the murmurs of the crowds and shrieks of excited children, she began to craft the narrative she had always dreamed of. Perhaps a place where she was wanted, and a place where she belonged. Sidney eyed the pink flower in his niece's hand and beamed. So, what did you think of my beautiful girl? She's quite something, isn't she? Went through quite a lot of trouble to get her. Not every circus has an elephant, let alone a place like our little operation. But I insisted. Calliope had never seen an elephant in real life before, and Essie didn't disappoint. During the show, the majestic beast had leaned across the front row and handed Calliope a carnation, delicately clasped in her coiled trunk to the delight of onlookers. The audience was spellbound. And so was Calliope. Oh yes, she's amazing. And the horses, and the acrobats. Those women were so completely breathtaking. They made flying on the trapeze look like nothing at all. Is this what it's like every single day? Sydney lifted the flap of the tent for her, and they ducked inside. People, animals, and props rushed around her in a blizzard of activity. Painted faces, spangled costumes, feathers, and swishing tails all melded into a cacophony that was a true carnival. 
all apprehension she possessed about her new family was forgotten when Sydney led her through the throng of performers and roustabouts, introducing her to so many people that she at once lost track. She tried to keep a mentalist of the variable jubilee of names and worldly accents. The lion tamer from Germany, she thought. The dog trainer from Norway. Oh, the beautiful flying sisters. Sydney waved them over and Calliope gaped, still mesmerized as they glided through the chaos to where she stood with the ringmaster. Even on the ground, they still seemed to move as one. Calliope, meet Theodora and Theodosia, her sister, the fair twin. Our queens of the sky. The sisters both bowed graciously to Sydney's guest, and Calliope stared, transfixed. Up close, everything about the twins seemed to shimmer, from the glossy hair to their pale skin and bright eyes and intricate costumes. Calliope suddenly felt very self-conscious and drab amidst all the splendor. She patted her light blue overcoat in an effort to somehow feel more presentable. As if reading her thoughts, the first sister, Theodora, gently plucked the carnation out of Calliope's grasp, snapped the stem, and tucked it behind Calliope's ear with a smile. Then each of the sisters took one of Calliope's hands. Theodora gave Calliope's hand a little squeeze, appraising her quick handiwork. She planted a light kiss on Calliope's right cheek, while Feodosia followed suit on the opposite side. Ah, Sydney, your long-lost niece, da? Feodora glanced for a moment at Sydney. He nodded and opened his mouth to speak, but Feodosia cut him off, eyes fixed on Calliope. Welcome to our family. The twins both flashed luminous smiles at the new arrival and flanked Calliope as Sydney led the way through the post-show melee. Calliope's face had warmed under the brush of their soft lips, and she suddenly felt as if she had one too many sips of Dr. Grisham's brandy. She blinked, struggling to bring the Russian world back into focus. The scent is something... Pleasant and floral floated around her head, and she held onto the twins like a lifeline. Poor Sydney has been looking forward to meeting you for such a very long time, Feodora said over her shoulder. She still had a firm grip on Calliope. It was all a girl could do to put one foot in front of the other. Her head was positively swimming. Activity continued to whirl around her, but her only focus was on the twins while they drifted across the floor. When Sydney said you arrived, we were all just so delighted. The pair continued to chatter about other cities, fellow performers, and staying so long in New York. You are good, little one, da? Come along, little one. You are fine. The visages of the beautiful sisters swam together in Calliope's brain. She looked at Feodora, the words echoing around in her mind. You are fine. Had Feodora's mouth even moved? All Calliope could do was sway along, as if she were moving in a trance. She was becoming more and more blissfully detached. She all but seemed to walk on air between the Fea sisters, listening to their dreamy, lilting voices that somehow were carried directly to her ears through all the noise and madness. She had long ago lost track of Uncle Sidney, and didn't particularly care. 
she would have followed the entrancing pair of young women to the ends of the earth. Feodora and Feodosia released Calliope's hands in order to open the canvas at the far end of the tent, which led back to the thoroughfare. Losing contact with them was like waking up suddenly to a bucket of ice being thrown on her face. And Calliope came to herself with a start. As she gasped, putting a hand on her chest. Blinking furiously, she steadied her breath and tried not to appear as out of sorts as she felt. I'm so sorry. I must have lost myself in a in daydream. This place is so... I can't find the words. I want... I want to be a writer, and I can't find the words. It happens. All the time. Theodora winked. Do not worry. Theodosia agreed. They stood in place like guardians, about to ask a riddle for Calliope to pass. Together, they regarded Calliope for a long moment, then pulled on the canvas. Have you been to see our professor? As if on cue, the striped fabric parted to reveal the dark countenance of one Professor Pyman. With Sidney Calibus at his side. The professor's smile was barely visible under the shadow of his hat. There you are, young lady. I see my lovely girls have made your acquaintance. I do hope they are making you feel most welcome here. Calliope managed a small sound that resembled a yes, but was not inclined to step any farther. The twins now stood on either side of Pyman, silent sirens who were still calling to their guest, enticing her to move. Walk with me, Calliope. With us. He nodded to Sydney, who theatrically danced backward and offered an arm to his niece. Pyman turned to the two acrobats, who now rested close together like birds perched on a wire, poised with both pairs of bright eyes still fixed on Calliope. Thank you, my loves. I'll see you back at the tent. Miss Calliope, Sydney, and I have some business to attend to at present. The twins bowed their heads, and the professor stooped to kiss each crown of shiny, pale green curls, and the pair turned to leave. Before Calliope could blink or beg them to stay, they were disappearing behind another tent. Dopobachinia, dear Calliope. We'll see you soon, Drujak Moye. Paimon's smile was all but ghostly in the shadows. The sculpted scorpion on his walking stick seemed to wink in the fading light of the evening. He skirted Sydney to catch Calliope's arm on the other side, as one cuts in during a waltz. The thoroughfare was becoming increasingly deserted as more patrons filed out toward the gate. Come along. We have much to discuss. Yes. <clears throat> much to discuss indeed. Three days later. In the days after she first visited the circus, everything in the outside world was dulled to Calliope. It was as if everything she knew, the mundane, the regular, ceased to truly exist outside of the tents and wagons back on Coney Island. As she stood alone in the brownstone row home she had shared with her guardian downtown, 
alone in her room. She realized that the house seemed very much the same, even though Calliope had packed up all her worldly belongings. One trunk and one carpet bag was all it took to hold everything she owned. Everything that was truly hers up until this moment. Her diary sat open on the otherwise empty desk, filled with her descriptions of the circus and the people she met. Sydney, Professor Pyman, the twins. So many things that had captured her heart and her imagination that day. I understand why people run away with the circus. The lights and the music, the crowds and the costumes. The freedom that comes with finally leaving home. And the possibilities of finding a new one. After the show, she had walked with Professor Pyman and Sydney. Her tea and biscuits had been laid out in Sydney's wagon. Pyman sat down, offering Calliope the other chair in the cramped space. While Sydney milled about, pointing out one keepsake or another from the show's travels before they had finally settled on the island for the last two years. Certainly you are welcome to stay with us, my dear. Now that you are here, we can't imagine you elsewhere. Isn't that right, Sydney? Sydney stammered yes and a few other pleasantries. But Calliope felt more and more sure that no one made a move without the professor say so. He had settled into the darkest corner of the room, comfortable and at ease in the shadows it seemed. So unlike any other man she'd ever met. As Sydney darted around the room and regaling his knees with one story or another. Pyman merely observed. Clypey could feel him watching her, his eyes fixed on her from under the brim of his bowler hat. As the hour grew late and Clypey stood to return to Brooklyn, Pyman rose and reached into his pocket. At first, he had nothing, but like magic, a small piece of silver seemingly appeared out of thin air and dropped into her palm. A small silver coin with the worn outline of a woman and some words she recognized as Greek, but when she brought it closer in the dim light, she looked up at the professor, mouth agape just a bit. A token, your namesake, Miss Calliope. Yes, from the country of Greece in antiquity. Please, take it with my best wishes. Oh, sir, I can't. Shouldn't this be in a museum? I... I don't think I... <laughs> I have quite the collection, dear. Please, it's been waiting for you, here, in my care. He took her hand in his and folded it around the gift. Her wide, brown eyes catching the glint of a kind of smile on the mysterious man's face. Could it be that she felt something, some kind of energy, something strange but familiar at the same time while in Hyman's presence? It was indescribable, other than noting it as such. No words reached her mind that could convey it. Just a feeling. Perhaps, Calliope mused, it was just that she was so unused to gifts. Her guardian, Dr. Grisham, had never been one to lavish presents or any tokens of affection for that matter. Save one, a pendant. A small gold rectangle with one side bearing the remnants of an intricate symbol and writings faded through time and wear before she even received it. The other side bore lines of what 
could have been an antiquated script. But no one, not even Dr. Grisham, or one of her many history teachers or professors, could identify the language or its meaning. Whatever it was, Dr. Grisham had been most insistent that she wear it always. On one occasion, she had removed it when her guardian, uncharacteristically home for more than a few days, saw fit to take her to the opera to see a performance of Faust on her 13th birthday. The housekeeper, and also her true caretaker, Mrs. Porter, had made her a lovely new dress. She felt very grown up in the fashionable gown, full of ruffles and lace, and a sheer fabric that buttoned high on the neck. And where's your medallion? He bellowed when she came downstairs. No compliments, no niceties, or other observations about her appearance. Calliope opened her mouth to respond while simultaneously pointing up to her bedroom, but he didn't wait for a sound. Go and get it. I never wish to see you without that bit of jewelry about your neck. Do you understand me, girl? Yes, sir. She ran back upstairs to do as she was bid. All told, it was quite possibly the longest conversation she'd ever had with her enigmatic guardian, such as he was. Back in the here and now, Clypey was once again in her desolate room. Opening the trunk back up, Clypey touched the small piece of metal at her throat. Her fingers moved blindly over the familiar indentations and edges, still unable to decipher their meaning. She touched the chain, the delicate links of gold that hadn't left her body for more than a few moments for as long as she could remember. Should she ask the mysterious Professor Pyman? Perhaps he would know. But for now, Dr. Grisham wasn't here any longer, was he? As terrible as his death had been, still no murderer had been caught. Calliope took a deep breath. She followed the links to the back, fumbled for the clasp. Perhaps it was an act of defiance. Perhaps it was the urge to move on from this life, this house, so full of questions and loneliness and strangeness. Her index finger found the metal clip and she caught it under her fingernail. Just one quick movement to end. Miss Calliope? Hello? Although the voice was soft, loud enough to be heard, but gentle and deep at the same time, it was a strange man's voice. And she was here all alone. An icy wash of fear and adrenaline consumed her as the footsteps drew nearer heavy as they made their way down the hall. As she dug through the carpet bag, looking for anything, a letter opener, a hat pin, but only came up with a handful of handkerchiefs and stockings. Before she could look further, he was there. He filled the doorway entirely with his broad shoulders, having to dip his head to avoid hitting it on the entryway. Even in a smart tweed suit, without the leopard print costume, she recognized him from the posters at the circus. The Colossus, Professor Pyman had called him. But now, he stood awkwardly in the hallway, merely ducked forward, a newsboy hat in his hands. He stepped through the doorway and somehow unfolded to a greater size.
I'm sorry if I gave you a start. The professor. He sent me to help you fetch your things. The words took a few moments to register, and Calliope shook her head as if clearing a mental dust, much like the real particles that floated through the bare room in a sunbeam. She walked towards the now familiar stranger and offered a hand. Of course. How kind. Calliope Grish. Calibus. Now, I suppose. The dark-haired man looked not much older than Calliope's 18 years, and certainly handsome in a way that made Calliope feel the blood rush to her cheeks. He quickly replaced his hat and offered his own hand in return. Pleased to meet you, Miss Calibus. They just call me Gideon. From the south? Gideon? Just Gideon? (laughs) Hmm. Texas, Miss Calliope. I'm from Texas. Born and bred. So, you'll be staying with us then? I haven't fully decided. But I don't believe I have many other options at the moment. I never realized poor Dr. Grisham didn't own this house. And the landlord only gave me until the end of the month. So, I must leave. Well, I know the professor hopes that you will be staying with us. Which reminds me. A man gave me this on the way in. It's addressed to you. He handed her a slightly crumpled envelope. Ivory engraved stationery with the most perfect calligraphy. While Gideon looked on, Calliope opened the letter, but only began to read. Miss Calliope, let me help you with that necklace before you lose it. She turned slightly, but before she could protest, the giant of a man reached out, caught the pendant before it dropped to the floor, and deftly proceeded to fasten it around her neck again without so much as another word. There you go. I'm sure you wouldn't want to misplace that. It has some value, I imagine. She watched as he easily hauled the trunk over one shoulder and held out his hand for her bag, which she struggled to pick up from the desk chair and placed in his waiting hand. Lastly, she grabbed her diary, held it close to her chest, and took one last look around the room. I've often wondered... But no one could ever tell me. Maybe the professor could tell you. He seems to have an eye for this kind of thing. He's waiting for us back on the island, and we're to find him straight away when we get back. He's most anxious to talk with you. Without your uncle. Why is that, do you think? The professor has his reasons. And I've never had cause to doubt him. Halcyon, the Book of Pyman podcast, and all its entities are a production of Pyman Media, LLC, all rights reserved. Halcyon, the Book of Pyman is written by Shannon Lynn and James Gray. Directed and edited by Jared Huffaker. Music and sound effects provided by Epidemic Sound. All episodes are available wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And Professor Pyman asks for you to please rate, review, and subscribe. And visit halcyonpodcast.com for more information. 